I don't think people understand that because they haven't seen it here. The amazing amount of jobs that will be created in this energy sector. When you think about how broad it is, yes, it's offshore wind, it's onshore wind, it is the vehicles, it's the solar panels, it is the stuff that goes around the solar panels, which are the racks and the trackers, it is the geothermal, it's the hydropower, it's the nuclear, it's the whole ball of wax, so many jobs and all of the supply chain that could be made in the United States, and you're starting to see it happen here. The idea is unlimited energy sources domestically that can be used locally. Eventually, we'll figure out ways to store it better, but it's domestic, and it's solve supply chain issues. Given that we get a lot of our energy from fossil fuels, which as we know right now, the prices are very volatile, right? So if you just look at gasoline, um, you know, most people have a gas powered engine and so they see it at the pump every day. But if you are one of the lucky ones who have an electric vehicle, you don't even see a gas engine, I mean a gas lean station. You don't even, it doesn't register because you never have to go there. You also pay a huge amount less in maintaining the vehicle because it's got many fewer moving parts. And the battery that makes up that vehicle, that's got to be built somewhere. That's more jobs, of course. And often we get those batteries from Asia, but this president wants to onshore that as a piece of the supply chain as well. There are a lot of people who will not purchase an electric vehicle for a few reasons, one of which is this so-called range anxiety, this fear that, that they won't be able to charge their car in the midst of their journey or in the midst of their day. That's one of the issues, and, and it's one of the ones that you're trying to address. Right. There's two issues, really. It's a range anxiety, people who are afraid that they're not going to find a charging station near them and won't be able to power their vehicle. And the second is that the vehicle itself may be too expensive. And so what the president has done in the bipartisan infrastructure law and in the Build Back Better Act is address both of those. So in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we've got seven and a half billion dollars to build out up to 500,000 charging stations, but particularly in areas where the private sector has not gone yet. So we're going to have the charging stations available and bring down the price of the electric vehicle through tax credits at the dealer. So I go to the dealer, off the hood will be a $7,500 tax credit to bring that car down to the price of a gas engine vehicle. Mm -hmm. There are some who are criticizing the Democratic Party as being too far left on the issue of the environment. How do you, how do you address those criticisms? You know what? Democratic states and Republican states are all in on building out clean. I mean, I was recently in North Dakota they are, that governor, he is all about building out the clean energy economy, even though they have a lot of fossil fuel investments, because he sees it as growing the pie. Texas is like number one in uh, wind, number two in solar. They have built out the whole infrastructure that and have put thousands and thousands of people to work. So there may be what politicians are saying, but what's happening on the ground is that the private sector and government are partnering to make sure that people have the opportunity to get jobs in this sector. People need to understand this is a transition. We're not gonna flip a switch and be off of fossil fuels tomorrow. What we wanna do is grow the pie and build out this clean energy side. So the, the people who have been working in oil and gas or in mining for coal, we want them to see themselves as building out energy 2.0, which is this clean energy future. What's going to be the thing that moves the needle uh, off of, for instance, we've just had to release oil from the strategic petroleum reserves to bring the price of gas down. How do you square the incentives to keep gas prices low with the need to move on to I can tell you, fuel stuff. this president feels very strongly that everyday citizens should not be hurting uh, by prices at the pump, and that's why he's all over this. But this is a transition. So well, we don't want people hurting, and we want to build out clean. And we know that eventually we will be in a place where, we're, where most people are going to be driving electric vehicles, but we're not there today. You are on the cusp of new forms of energy some which will ultimately be cheaper than they are, some that are quite affordable right now. But the, the danger is you don't want to, you know, you don't want to tip us over into an inflationary uh, era. Right. I mean, first of all, long term, the best strategy for energy prices to be stable and low and reliable is to build out a clean energy future. And that means wind and solar. It means batteries to make sure we can store that. It means nuclear. It means the whole ball of wax. And I will say this, Ali, I mean, 
right now it is cheaper to have wind and solar in most places are cheaper than in, than fossil fuels because we've already got enough supply out there we've already done the technological advances to reduce the cost the department of energy we are focused on how do we bring down costs further and we want to look at new forms of clean technology like hydrogen clean hydrogen from renewable sources for example can be the answer to dispatchable clean baseload power but we're not there yet this is why the technology solutions are very, very important in these early stages. We haven't had new nuclear power generation in the United States for a long time. Is that going to play a part in this future? One, nuclear now provides 50% of our clean energy in this country. 20% of our overall energy. If we want to get to 100% clean energy, nuclear has to be a piece of it. People are nervous about uh, nuclear from legacy issues. We have a blue ribbon, gold ribbon, whatever it is, standard in the United States. Our Nuclear Regulatory Commission is extremely strict, and we have not had incidents. And so, what recently, certainly within you know yeah. recent memory, sometimes people are nervous because of the nuclear waste that often sits adjacent to these nuclear power plants because we have not as a nation settled on where a safe repository is. So this week we just launched a from uh, the recommendations of a Blue Ribbon Commission, a consent-based siting process where we're putting out a request for information about what should it look like, who might be interested for compensation in being able to safely store nuclear waste. And um, that, I think, once we identify that in partnership with a community, um, that will, I think, take a lot of the, you know, the naysayers uh, that will give them a chance to reconsider. There's a mistake in it. Yeah. One of these days, may not be too long from now, this spot we're, we're standing in is going to be very relevant because of the offshore power. What is it going to look like? What, what's, the, what's the elevator pitch for offshore wind generation, offshore electricity generation? That it will be abundant, cheap, dispatchable, baseload power. You won't even be able, like these wind turbines are going to be miles and miles offshore, so you won't even see them. We don't want really people to be thinking about energy. We just, you know, when they flip on the switch, they want the, the they want reliability. They want the lights to come on, and they don't want to have to pay an arm and a leg for it. That is a huge benefit of what I think we will see into the future, but we're not there yet.